it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to you um, Laurie Hastings, that's travelled up from London today, and uh, David Troops. Is it Troops. Troops. Yes, who's just come from just outside of, uh, of Wakefield. Yeah, yeah, Wakefield sort of area. So quite you know different different uh, distances today. Um, and uh, yeah, so Laurie's uh, works as an illustrator, and, and David, who um, is a, as a poet predominantly, which is where I kind of met them about three or four years ago. So doing some collaborative work, and so I've asked them both to come into today. So I really hope you enjoy this session. Okay, and I'll take it over to you guys. Can I start now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So as Heidi said, I'm Laurie. And, and I'm Dave. Um, and we first became friends in 2004 um, when we both um, lived in Edinburgh and Ed um, Dave had just finished his um, I did a, at that point. Yeah, yeah, master's degree in, um, in writing, basically creative writing. And I just finished my BA at um, Edinburgh College of Art, which was in illustration. Um, and yeah, we living in beautiful Edinburgh, as you know, the well, you may, I don't know if some of you have been, but the festival and it's very beautiful Georgian architecture. Um, but this is the place that we actually met, um, which wasn't quite as glamorous, but um, this was a business park on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, called, yeah, called the Guile. It's really, a really horrible sort of place. That's, that's exactly what my, my memory of it was from nine years ago. Yeah. And we, uh, we got temp jobs uh, working in a call, call center the sort of the worst kind of thing, but you know, you sort of when you recently graduated, you do what it takes, <coughs> and that's how we met. Yeah. Um, and um, I had, um, well, I suppose the the whole idea of us working together in a kind of collaboration began when I um, I showed Laurie a poem that I had written um, on a uh, on a bus ride home from the Guile, this sort of pack of office workers. And, um, and I, I, I wrote a poem about that scene, and, um, and I think Laurie thought it might be a fun thing to illustrate. Yeah, so I had a kind of interest in poetry, not that I know a lot about poetry, but we just, David showing me this poem, and I just thought it was a really beautiful poem. So it wasn't until, I think, maybe like four years later that um, we sort of kept in touch by emails because we become friends through this experience of being in, working in a call centre for six weeks. Um, which I thought was going to be the most awful experience ever after finishing graduating and everything, but I just needed some money <laughs> and um, it was really good to meet Dave and to, to do the work that we've done together now since then. Um, so, yeah, that was when I think on the next slide. Yeah, uh, so this was the actual poem. Yeah, I don't expect anyone to read my handwriting, but I did go back. I, I keep all my notebooks and all my drafts, and that is the the... I thought it'd be fun for you to see the first draft of the uh, of the poem, which is more or less as it appears finally. Um, but I'll read it out for you once we see uh, yeah. we see Laurie's picture. So, we go to the next one, I guess. Um, so it was a few years later when we said um, we should maybe let's ask them, can I illustrate your poem? We could maybe produce a postcard and sell it in some galleries all around Edinburgh or something like that. Um, and then as we talked about it more, we realised that you know why not, why do one postcard when you do six? So that's what we did. We did six postcards. Um, and on the back of each. Uh, I don't know what's next. Um, yeah, you can go to yeah. the next one. <laughs> and so on, on the back of each postcard, and this, by the way, isn't a poem to go with that illustration, but on the back of each postcard is the poem that goes with it. And um, and we, uh, we sort of arrange it into kind of a three and three thing, so that three poems, sorry, three of these sets began with a poem. That, that I gave to Laurie and she produced an illustration for, and three of them began with an illustration that um, that Laurie gave to me and I then produced a poem for. And, uh, so that was the kind of, we wanted it to be equal. I think for both of us it was kind of, well I suppose an illustrator you're kind of used to working from a brief, but I think for you maybe working from an image to create a poem. Yeah, kind of a nice prompt and, and sort of challenging myself not to just write a poem that would that sort of describe the picture. You want to kind of get into the, the idea of the scene or the characters you find there, sort of use it as a prompt to take you in some different direction. Because I think um, a, a lot of Laurie's artwork is very sort of city, urban people oriented. A lot of my writing is I'm kind of naturally inclined toward, I guess you'd call it nature poetry, though I hate that term, but out, 
out uh, Dorothy stuff. Oh, I came from Leeds this morning, but I actually am um, from Massachusetts originally, um, and I kind of grew up more or less in, in the woods, it feels like. So that's a lot of what I write about. So we're each being prompted to kind of write outside of, or to produce work outside of our usual kind of comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah? Sounds fair? Yeah, sounds fair to me. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I think if we go next one, we're on. So this was, um, I don't know if you want to do the reading first. Of Shall time. I read the poem? Sorry, it'll take me just a moment so to, uh, to this find is, myself. So, um, from that poem that Dave wrote about us making the journey home, yeah. as we no. make our way home. As we make our way home, which was, became kind of the title of the whole, the whole work, which, um, as we make our way home. On the bus, all the heads sway gently together like eelgrass, rooted in the cold, moved by the vast moving of the sea. It had to fit on a postcard, <laughs> you see. Um, and um, yeah, I, I suppose this one I wrote unprompted except for what I saw, but it was just, I remember it was a very, very and every, the bus was completely packed. It was a two-level, double-decker bus that was completely packed, two seats, two heads on every seat kind of thing. No one was saying a word. Everyone was just, I don't know, just, the soul kind of shrivels up when you work in a place like the Gaia, perhaps. No one was saying anything, and that sort of peaceful as the bus swayed, all oh, the heads swayed slowly to one side was what kind of grabbed me and what made me scribble those lines we saw in the notebook. And um, alas... Yeah, that's where I sort of took that, those lines of the eel graph, that's what really struck me of that kind of motion. Um, so I kind of wanted to depict Edinburgh in a kind of almost dreamlike state when you finish work and you're kind of on the bus home. Um, and this is an actual bridge, this is Northbridge in Edinburgh. Um, Northbridge, right? Northbridge, <laughs> yes. um, And there isn't actually um, an ocean of water there, but there, there was back in the day a lock underneath that part of Edinburgh, which I think was drained. And yeah, it was all marshy. Yeah. Um, so, but I kind of liked, I, I didn't want to really literally kind of interpret Dave's poem and have this eel grass, but I just wanted to, the image to have that kind of movement and that feeling of the head swaying that comes and forward. And, and so that's really, really it, where we kicked off. Um, so this one, I then, I, this was the work that was initiated by me one of the other postcards. So obviously last time Dave wrote the poem and then I did the response. This time I just did the artwork. Um, and sort of having started at that point of showing a part of Edinburgh, um, a lot of my work previous, um, including my degree show work, had been all about the city and how strangers um, do or don't interact and how um, people generally go about their day-to-day -day lives. So kind of tried, I thought I'd take that as a theme through the work. Um, so this is kind of an observation of, of Edinburgh. Um, and it was actually at the gig I was at. Um, it was in an old church, and the way it was uh, sort of the seating was kind of this big archway. So you you look down at the stage. Um, so the people opposite you. Um, I just remember looking across and seeing this kind of really rhythmic pattern of people sitting and sort of sharing this kind of collective moment. I think of enjoying what was going on, or not enjoying. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of why I chose to create the image. Um, and, yeah, I also like the idea of um, the viewer, sort of, if I hadn't given that explanation, kind of not knowing what necessarily all the people are looking at and kind of leaving that open to their interpretation. Um, so in this case, well, I was actually at a gig, which was of um, Jan Tiersen, who's, um, do you know the Amelie soundtrack, the movie Amelie? So it's really sort of beautiful, like piano music, but it was for his new album, which was this sort of like his rock album. <laughs> so it wasn't what I expected at all. Um, but then Dave wrote a poem, which is sort of shows the kind of how you can interpret something. Yeah, because I mean I had no no idea what what these people were looking at, but I had myself recently been to a, um, a rock concert, or is that baroque? I don't know. Um, at uh, another venue, and I kind of use that as a prompt. So the poem I wrote was, the, the church waits in a drowned light, a sunken place where the charms of our world detach in to the gloom with the past and the future and the other useless things. A, a, a cellist digs the deepest note, a throaty drag of horsehair across metal, the 
the, the um, core rock of soul tested for depth. None of us rem remembers asking the, the question, or even what the question is or was, but how they rise now from the stage, answer after answer after answer. Because I suppose what I was trying to get at with that was the sense that I didn't know what these people were looking at, but they seemed to be receiving some kind of difficult information, you know? Or maybe they was confused by <laughs> wanting to see the guy who was yeah. <laughs> who did the Omni soundtrack, and here he is trying to rock out. But uh, yeah. it's that's that's kind of the fun part of the um, of sort of working from Laurie's images when I don't really know what the story is behind them. Is it allows me a, a sort of a large space to come up with my own ideas, my own stories, but it, it just pushes those in a slightly different direction than I would have otherwise done without the prompt. That's all. So about that. Uh, this is one that I, that the, um, the pairing started with, a, with one of my poems, which is called like, like a Strange Book We All Read From. So I'll read that now. I, I should, it's a, it's, um, should introduce it a little bit. It's a very straightforward and kind of melancholy poem that came from sort of dialogue out of my real life and just a sort of very difficult time. Um, and the way it's arranged on the page, I didn't think to put it up on the slide, but it's in two halves there. They don't quite correlate to two people talking, but there is that sense of, of a large gap between the bits of information. You okay, I say, and she says, yes, are you okay? And I say, yes. These are not lies. We have, we have um, calibrated our truth to our injuries. Three sparrows on the telephone wire, second day of fall. Just a, a little slice of life poem, I suppose. I appreciate the fact that there are three little dots on the telephone wires outside. Um, uh, shall I talk? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so basically, I really love the poem, and I really came across this this idea of a kind of difficult relationship, but not really saying what you mean on on the end of the telephone line. So I kind of I, I was also trying to play around with something a little bit more conceptual than kind of just showing the scene. Um, and so that's sort of the book, um, and but the characters are like very developed, um, and obviously far away from each other. So I guess with this, the main thing for me was sort of playing with the book as a, a device to show, to sort of tell the story, <laughs> literally and metaphorically. So yeah. yeah. So this is, um, there are six postcards, but this is the last one we're going to talk about um, in this set. Um, this was an image, um, again, that I was sort of exploring uh, being in Edinburgh and places in Edinburgh. Um, this is by Portobello, which is by the seaside. Um, and for me, the image, um, this was a, a big tiled wall, which wasn't the thing as I've shown it there, but um, it's just a really sort of retro, really beautiful wall. Um, and for me, it was just kind of like a sort of happy trip um, on a happy day out, really. Um, and I guess in the sort of nature of the collaboration, what's, what was nice is that Dave then um, took it and wrote a poem about it. Yeah, so the poem I ended up writing about this very sunny, happy thing is called What Lashes Us to Misery. It was kind of, it was a bad day, I suppose. But I was going through some issues with my, my visa to live here. And I was just, you know, you, you sort of you take prompts out of your own life. So this is the poem that I wrote. A letter from, from the government, which no human wrote, sits by morning's still life of crumbs in the sour light globbing through yellow glass while green flies slowly hijack the, hijack the uh, coriander. And outside, gold stake the chimney pots above the boy who passes quietly on his bicycle roped to the smooth flywheel of the world. And that's what I wanted to create, I suppose, was a movement from a very precise thing, a letter on a table, some light coming through a window, and then connected to this and the idea. You know, I, I love the idea that I write about it in a lot of different things, the idea that everything is mechanically joined up. Not, I mean, we're all connected in some sort of you know, Zen kind of way as well, but the, the idea that there could be an almost literal connection between the wheels going round and everything else that's happening in the scene in the world. The poem is written um, as a single sentence with very little punctuation. 
and it's just hopefully I read it that way, but it just sort of slides on through and everything is this complete single fluid motion. And it's just a shame, I suppose, for Laurie that this very sunny print ended up with a title that has the word misery in it. But that's the that's the chances you take when you work with another person. Yeah. So shall I go on? Yeah, so after doing that um, first place card set in 2009, we then, in um, 2011, um, did another one. We sold out of our limited position, so we were feeling pretty good about that. Uh, and this time went for an addition of 1,000 uh, first cards. Uh, not really. Um, but we, yeah, so this one was called Standing in the Sea. Um, and differently from the first collaboration, um, this one started with, well, at first we thought we'd do something like give each other a brief or a kind of theme that we could all, that we could both work under, but we found it too restrictive and it just wasn't really working. So we swapped some um, poems and images and um, this was the image that I sent to Dave that I've been working on kind of separately. Yeah, and uh, I, I suppose what kind of struck me about it was there's this isolated figure in a very moving, I mean, you know, literally physically moving environment, and that kind of became the only theme we had, the kind of the, the only agreement was that we wanted to, to sort of create scenes where there was a single character or, you know, in, in, in a kind of dialogue with his or her world and environment, and that became the, uh, that became the brief. So, uh, look at the first one. So, yeah, this one for me the, um, was kind of what Dave said, the idea of um, kind of um, moments of quiet or moments of reflection that you can have in your life and how the environment around you can affect that. And um, I don't know, I'm sure everybody relates in some way to sort of being in the ocean and being on your own in this kind of vastness of the ocean um, and how it can influence the way you feel in your thoughts. Um, so that was just really quite a simple idea. And, and um, yeah. and I suppose I just I picked that up and again I find it because when, when I'm writing poetry that's un, unprompted in this kind of way I tend to write about myself or my own experiences you almost can't not even if you try to invent the most fantastic ex, um, situation ultimately you're still writing about yourself it, you know you can't produce art that's not about yourself I suppose but um, it was all the same very enjoyable to try to enter the head or tell the story of someone that's not at all me. Um, so the poem, which is called Standing in the Sea, which became the title of the whole, the whole set, um, is Our sister is an ark of herself, a pool of relics. She fountains nothing. She is desperate to persist. Bright eels roll among the gentle palms. She has survived it all and she will build this house with nails of beauty. That line, she, had, uh, she will build this house with nails of beauty, or I will build this house with nails of beauty, was something that was in the notebook from a long time ago. Um, and I've been trying to find a home for it for months, if, if, if not a year or two, trying to find a place to, to bring that line out. I, you know, I really liked it, but I couldn't find a home for it. It wasn't until I sort of, I guess it sounds cheesy, but met and in, in, in interacted with this, this um, image and this um, character that it became, I should have found the opportunity to, in, to use that line of you know, someone who's going to build the next house, the sort of the part of the life, whatever, that she's going to create around herself. And if nails of beauty, maybe the last one was nails of pain. So, sort of what I'm thinking. How's, does that sound all right? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Too artsy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one, uh, which is called their their daughter uh, was one that was started off by one of my poems, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. And um, as it happens, I now am a am a dad to a 14 month old daughter, and a print of the same is about her talk, but um, uh, but I wasn't at the at the time I wrote this. Um, but it's funny this poem. I just I that actually it's. it's the original draft of it is on the back of a draft of another poem that I was spending a lot of time struggling with. And then I just had this idea of, I, I, was, I liked the idea of, again, thinking, because at the time we were working on the brief of characters interacting with the large environments, and a little girl walking through this melon, this sort of ripe, ran, rancid melon field struck me as an, as an idea. So I kind of turned the paper over and wrote out in, this, in just a single go of the 
this, um, this smallish poem, which I, I really enjoyed. So the poem is, the uh, cooling, still warm blue of September rolls westward, <coughs> sliced up by con contrails as Venus lows and glows. Their daughter toe steps among the twizzles of melon vine, which follow everything, seek everything. Lately, now and again to fatten the soul, sweet and blind. Um, so yeah, my kind of interpretation was, I suppose, quite, sort of quite literal in this one. I just wanted to create that kind of um, warm atmosphere, the set rolling September day, um, and also just the description of kind of the, the melon vine, the, the, the daughter sort of toe-stepping the monster. So I suppose in that sense it was quite a more literal interpretation, but I also quite like the um, kind of the effect of playing with the composition and just really getting across that kind of the idea of the twisting and intertwining um, foliage. Oh. And like David was saying earlier, I, I up to this point I've been doing a lot of work based in kind of urban, more kind of urban environments and exploring cities and things like that. Um, but because I grew up in a city, so that's sort of more what I'm inclined to. Um, whereas for me, it's more of a, it was nice to explore something different in terms of uh, looking at how to draw vegetation and that kind of thing. I like the fact that she's standing to one side as well. You almost get the sense that she's pushed out by these enormous melons in the front. Um, shall I go on? Um, so this was an image initiated by me. Um, again, that, that idea of being immersed in your environment. Um, and almost the idea that you could be taken back to, like transported to another time. So if you're in a, a kind of old antique shop and all the objects, and um, this is sort of supposed to be like a fan diary, um, which is kind of exploring somebody else's life and reading through their diary and maybe somebody that's long gone. So um, I also just really enjoy it. That's something I love to do myself anyway. So um, sort of thinking about all the objects that you find in kind of um, old antique stores and things like that. Um, and the poem that I wrote about it is called The Artesian Well, which doesn't immediately strike you as that, but I, in this time, not the final line, but the beginning of it, the title is sort of the main metaphor, um, is something that I had in my head for a while. I've been trying to write a poem about my mother's mother, my um, grandmother, and uh, who had an artesian well in her back, backyard, which is a certain kind of well, I think, with like the groundwater pushes water up, but anyway, and that as a sort of a metaphor for her involvement with the land or the fact that she was sort of of, of that land that she lived in. And, uh, but I hadn't got anywhere with the poem, and then when I saw this, and I, I have to admit, I didn't immediately take it as a, as a thrift shop so much as someone sorting through another person's lives, may, life maybe in a move or something like that sort of, and, and then I thought, well, maybe it's, maybe it's someone who's died, and that allowed me sort of the, the, the prompt to enter this story about my own grandmother. So the poem, this was our mother, our grandmother, through whom we drew a kind of water, her mushroom soup, her lilac ghosts, her frames without paintings like an attic full of halos, the gills of an address book never thrown away, those names like moons coaxing a sea. Final image in that set. Um, well, it's oh, yeah, this yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, this one began from one of my poems, and uh, Turkey Hill is uh, well, it's probably a, a hundred thousand Turkey Hills in North America, but this per particular Turkey Hill is in a town that my wife and I were living back in Massachusetts in for a year or so, um, seven, eight years ago. And um, and uh, it's, it, it's, this was a very sort of literal note, notebook poem where what I, what I scratched down more or less stayed the way it was, as I recall. And again, there's not a lot of punctuation. It's done in a sort of way that wants to be read as a single breath, although it's too long to do that. Um, and uh, here's the poem, The Cook Fire at Turkey Hill. In the ribs and creeks of April, I remember now kneeling nestled in that crease of forest, that gully, down in the moss and moss rocks, feeding the cook fire, 
Lit by a chickadee, frantic to follow the spinning jewel of its own life. Those fields abandoned are not impossible to tell, off in the woods. A dusk of wind, I had to hide the fire away, down and increase in a moss gully of hemlocks and turkey fern. The purple cloud thrown sky mussing my smoky fire. And I remember thinking when I saw the final one, it was a, it was a very <coughs> relaxed, a very sort of relaxed happy looking scene. The original, oh, I, the original, the moment, I was terrified that my fire was going to spread. I, I had actually read a little cook fire to cook some hot dogs, but it was very windy, and I almost set the forest on fire. But I didn't. Um, it makes you already yeah. sorry about that. Well, I sort of took the more, I suppose, romantic imagery maybe from the poem. Um, and yeah, just like the idea of somebody kind of um, being finding a crazy spot within the woods and nestling away there, um, and that kind of um, the feeling of isolation and being able to enjoy the environment around you, um, which is kind of the theme that's going through. Um, for me, it was also again about kind of new, making new kind of imagery in terms of um, the leaves and the plants and um, the trees and um, using it to kind of explore new ways of, of making images, because I think you can get quite kind of as an illustrator working in kind of um, for commercial jobs, you can get quite stuck doing um, a certain type of style, especially if you're constantly commissioned to do the same work. Um, so this is really nice because I'm sort of um, experimenting about kind of um, pushing the style of my work a little bit more as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is yours. So yeah, I'm going to just talk a bit about my own work now for a few minutes. Um, so, I was just going to say, yeah. Okay, so basically, um, I, I sort of see my work as two different sides. Um, it's kind of like the commissioned work, which is my more commercial work, um, and then my printmaking and kind of personal work, which is like the work I've done with Dave. And, um, yeah, I, started, I did illustration because I, um, I did a foundation course at Chelsea College of Art, and um, I went there thinking I wanted to be an interior designer because I just I'd done graphics at school, and um, when I went did the module on interior design, um, I just kept drawing this sort of like flat images, and they kept trying to make me say we've got to visualize this in more of a 3D, and I just realised I don't really have that part of my brain, so um, all of my images are all quite sort of flat 2D, and I realised I'm kind of a 2D kind of so. Um, that was really good. Um, yeah, I was just going to say about my foundation as well. What I, I, I then moved to, illust I did my module on illustration, and that's when I thought, this is what I really want to do. Um, and it was quite a kind of conceptual course, so it wasn't about the end product and creating a really beautiful illustration. Um, it was more about kind of playing around with the idea of how you put across an idea and how you can kind of eloquently or succinctly um, Sort of communicate an idea to an audience of someone looking at. So um, lots of the work wasn't necessarily like a flat kind of finished image, um, which is a good place to start. But yeah, we can flip to the next slide. So here's my hand. Um, yeah, so printmaking is kind of my method of choice for producing my personal work. Um, just I, went, I then after my foundation went to Edinburgh College of Art, and they had a big print printmaking department there. So I use facilities and I just really love the process and having that time away from your desk, away from your computer and just doing something kind of, this kind of technical process of it. Um, I also really love, all my colours are really pastel and I just really love having kind of the tactile, having the paper and being able to get the colour, the exact <coughs> colour that you want it. Not, you know, when you're working on a computer screen, you, when you print something out, it's never quite the same. So I really like that kind of process. Um, yeah, I use my printmaking as well as a kind of a place to work through new ideas and try out different things, like I was saying, with the style of, from the cook fire image. Um, you can <laughs> um, so this was an image I created um, shortly after doing the, the second poster <coughs> project with Dave. Um, and for me, a lot of the work I've done um, in, in that, those projects were quite complex images. They were all screen printed images, all the images you showed before. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with the process, but you have to put down each colour at a time, one at a time. So some of those prints before were like 17 colours, which if you're doing an addition of 30, it's really time consuming. 
and I found a lot of people didn't really understand the process or know how much work went into them. So I started thinking, you know, people aren't really appreciating this kind of really like craft that I'm doing. Um, perhaps there's a way to do it with just one colour and just still make a really like atmospheric and impactful image. So I started playing around with, um, following on from the work I've done with Dave, um, I really enjoyed doing all the kind of vegetation. So that's, that's the kind of route I continued on. Um, and this is just a quite simple image, just trying to create that atmosphere, but just using more colour. So, yeah, that's all. Cool. Um, so, and then it kind of um, developed further. I started, this is all my sort of more recent work. Um, this was a poster for Print Club London, which is like a place in London that has a big print facility. Um, they have a gallery and they have shows and things. Um, so the submission was to do a movie poster. And so I'm thinking of more traditional movie posters, but you couldn't include words and things for copyright reasons. So um, I started thinking how I could make it an interesting brief for me, not because maybe I wouldn't be inclined to do a kind of traditional type of movie poster. Um, and then I've made a list of films, and one of them, this is The Birth of Suicide. Um, and again, I was trying to just sort of find a way that you could work, work the pattern um, and just use one kind of main colour and still have a really kind of impactful um, post image. And the, yeah, the colour behind was the colour of the paper that I printed onto, so kind of a bit of work there as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's, if you click, it does a sort of zoom in of the, which is now on my computer screen at this time, <laughs> it's huge now. Um, so yeah, this is an edition of 40, um, and they were, um, the idea of the show is that they get loads of press around it and um, they do 40 illustrators, for, um, editions, print editions of 40 for 40 pounds and everybody just comes in and buys hundreds of prints and it's just a really a real buzzing kind of show. I think there's an image of the exhibition. So this is the space they have in London to all the different places. Um, yeah. So I think there's a couple more just showing how I've kind of continued to explore this similar type of theme and inverting the colours um, and using the pattern. And I suppose the themes that we talked through with Dave are still kind of there in terms of the person kind of exploring their environment. Yeah, it's just kind of being harmonious with the space and um, yeah, so <laughs> Um, so then I've got to talk a little bit about my more commission work. So all that other stuff is kind of personal and self-motivated work. These are now um, kind of images that I've been um, commissioned to do. Um, so I kind of, I'll work to a step brief. Um, I'll be commissioned by an art director. And then you either work, depending on how hands-on they are, you either they'll give you loads of ideas or they'll just say, do what you want and come back to me. Um, and so the main kind of work I've done is books. Um, so publishing or editorial stuff for magazines or newspapers. Um, so yeah, we'll get through. Um, so I'll kind of, um, this is a project I've just started working on. Um, I'm doing a set of 10 illustrations for a new maternity unit at Chelsea and Western Hospital. Um, so I'll kind of start off with um, the kind of, a spider diagram, just like my main key themes, what's, what I'm thinking first of all, and then if um, sort of images come to mind, I'll kind of jot them down. Um, I'd actually done an initial one that was really, really messy, but I queued it up to show to the client because I didn't want them to think I was completely mad. Um, so you can click through. Um, then I'll get to this, this example I've used, um, the maternity project still ongoing. Um, this is for a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Um, who's a Lebanese author and um, he wrote the book, you might have read it, uh, it's got 26 different kind of poetic essays in it. So I was commissioned by Random House to do a cover for that, which I was really happy about. Um, and this is the stage that I kind of really jot down um, what kind of comes into my, after talking to the art, art director, what comes into my brain first in a really, you know, they're like terrible drawings, but they're just kind of like, this, basic composition and what I kind of first come up with in my mind. So, and then um, these are kind of more finished roughs. So, um, uh, when I spoke to the director originally, he was quite keen on using kind of um, like Arabic motifs and patterns. So, 
but, and he was quite keen on the idea of um, representing 26 different themes in the book. Um, but I, so we, kind of, that was the kind of initial rough, and then there was also there was lots of symbolism in the book, so I kind of pulled out the different things um, and did that one. And then the final one was just kind of pushing it, pushing back this idea and doing a more simplified version. And then we hit it. <laughs> so this is the final artwork that they chose. Um, so this is the middle one. And then this is the worked up artwork, which I will do all the drawing by hand and scan it in. And then um, I'll use kind of um, screen printed textures, which I've kind of um, I've created a library of textures, which I'll then kind of put into the work um, and bring the colour in. Use Photoshop and that's it kind of through all the stages through to the finished book. And, and then just kind of get to move on to So this is for another book called um, The Return of the Young Prince, um, which was uh, about 16 illustrations for um, a book that was published in eight different countries. Um, and yeah, the challenge here, I think they wanted it just to be a really simple um, colour palette, so greys and then one colour with different hues of the colour, so you'll see the red. Um, and I was working with um, somebody, I'm not sure how much I should say if I really filmed on this, but um, you get different types of clients and different kind of uh, amounts that they want to be involved in kind of feedback, so there was quite a lot of changes to do in this work. So were you the one who chose the colour? I wasn't, no, they were quite specific about the colour. Because red is not a very mean colour. Well, that's what I thought when I first began to see these appearing on your website. I thought that's outside of Lori's usual palette. Yeah, yeah. But it's good to be pushed in that way, because I suppose I would be inclined to put other colours in as well, but yeah. So, yeah, you can go on. Um, these are for Psychology's magazine, which is like a women's magazine. Some of you might know it. Um, I did this commission for, yeah, I had a commission for two years doing it for um, it a monthly article for Philip Perry. Um, so she did a column um, which was uh, about people having issues. She's a psychotherapist or psychoanalyst. And um, she would have somebody, she'd talk about a patient that come to see her um, and then the problem and how they resolved it or didn't resolve it. Um, and I would just illustrate it, work with the art directors um, and just come to, sometimes they'd give a real idea of what they wanted and sometimes they'd say, just leave it quite open and I'll just come up with some different ideas. So um, some are a bit more conceptual, and then others, this was about a girl with an eating disorder, so they didn't want to be do anything too kind of, um, they just wanted to keep it quite simple, just to show her sort of how she was. So, yeah. Um, this is another one for Psychology Magazine, but a separate kind of article. Um, and this is kind of related to the one colour work I was talking about before, so kind of that idea of how your, my personal work can then kind of filter into commissioned work and how it helps to give ideas and create new styles. And um, this one was um, about telling a story um, and how, how all the stories connected together. So essentially it was, it was a true story about a little girl who fell down a well in America, I think in the 70s or something. And um, it's because her mum rang to get the phone, um, and then she fell down. She fell down the well. And then somebody heard about the, the, her plight on the radio, um, and he was, it was a really inspirational story. So he stopped drinking, and then he started writing um, music, and he became a famous jazz musician. Um, not jazz musician, but folk. Kind of. And then um, the man who actually helped in her rescue, um, he actually became like a local hero, but then he fell into a depression and ended up killing himself. So um, it's just about the ideas of how you can, um, people tell stories to kind of <coughs> uh, about their lives and to give us their lives and meaning. So, yeah. <laughs> I think we're kind of, that's just a bit more kind of detail. Um, this is the Boston Globe. Um, Put this in just to show sometimes because of the, the, the uh, 
The subject of this was about um, young evangelicals um, being brought into the climate change debate, which is something I don't even know anything about American politics, <laughs> and that is a bit quite niche, I think. So um, uh, I guess I just put it in to show how you can get some crazy subjects, but then you can still find a way to kind of pull out the essence of what, what it is and um, illustrate it. Um, this one's the same, it's for, um, just for the cover of um, Midwives magazine, which is um, for the British Midwives Association. And again, a subject that I know very little about, but it was about how birthing centres are closing down and hospitals are opening up. And you can see I'm using that same kind of the vegetation and the leaves, um, and kind of working my style into something that's not really my area, um, subject to kind of area. Um, and yeah, the last one, this was um, for Woman and Home magazine and all of this area was kind of covered with um, the text of the article, it was a fiction piece, um, it was a story set in Alaska, so I just like the kind of composition of the main body of the image had to be at the top um, and then yeah, the foreground wasn't used as much, but they commissioned me on the back of a print that I'd done previously, so again I'm kind of just saying about that kind of interconnection of the personal work versus the commission work. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I was yeah, just going to put that in there so I knew it. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if anybody has questions now or do you want to, should we just wait to the end? Um, anybody have any pressing questions now? No, yeah, well, we'll just carry on and then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit about my Poetry. Um, I published two uh, books of poems. The uh, most recent one is *The Simple Man*, which came out early last year, and then *Parsimony* um, was my first one. Came out in two, 2009, um, both with the uh, with a sort of Scottish press uh, called um, Two Ravens Press. And um, thought I'd just talk briefly about the sort of the writing process for me. It very much begins with a lot of notebooks. I, I actually brought a few, but you guys know what notebooks look like. Um, but uh, I thought it, to sort of illustrate this, um, I should take you through a draft sequence. This is, I mean, there, there are different kinds of notebooks that's, that, that I keep. Some are very much like a workbook where I'm going through draft after draft of a poem, or I have some, I have one notebook that was a gift for my wife, and it's just this tiny little thing, but actually it's really handy for writing down little ideas, little, um, little lines that I, that I don't want to lose. I would never actually try to write a whole poem in this thing because I'd take up half of the book with it, but it's a great way to keep it in my pocket and even the boss at my day <coughs> prison. Oh man, this is being filmed. Um, scratch that bit. Uh, um, anyway, you know what I'm saying. So this was, I was keeping a notebook on a, um, on a trip back home to my family in Massachusetts a few years back and just writing about a day out in the, uh, out in the woods in wintertime and one line in particular which is and alone in the labor of leaving the world. It was writing about a hunter who I saw on an ATV, like a quad bike. Um, it, just as the sun was going down, lots of snow on the ground, very deep, and it was just a really quiet thing, but there was this one guy alone. We didn't know I was watching him. I was sat on a rock trying to feel zen-like or whatever. And, um, and he was trying to turn this quad bike around, and he had his gun on his back. It was muzzleloader season. That's um, uh, muzzleloader, it's, um, it's an archaic firearm. There's a season in hunting in America where you're allowed to use these old-fashioned firearms that are kind of like a black powder musket type thing, so people think that's a good time. I'm not a hunter myself. Um, but I like the idea of this guy. Again, it sort of goes back to the you know, dialogue with his environment. Um, there's something about the dusk, especially the winter dusk, when it happens really fast that I find really fascinating. It sort of feels like everything begins to drift a little bit, like nothing really exists quite anymore, where the sun's below the horizon and it's still light enough to see. So I like the idea that he was somehow trying to leave the world. He was struggling so much that everything was kind of vanishing around him. Of course, he can't actually leave the world. That's just sort of a whimsy. But there seemed to be a tension there. So I took that line and I just began it, um, to write over the course of a few days. And despite having computers and all that, I still write everything longhand at first. And I keep all of my um, drafts. Uh, it's nice to be able to go back. It's nice to think that if my computer breaks, I still have paper. It's nice to scratch things out and see what I scratched out. So I don't type something up until a later point. 
Um, and when I, so I typed, I type it up on the computer, then I'll print it out and go back and do hand amends to that. And uh, so I can always go back to a previous version and see what my ideas were. And then I was really struggling with this one. You might have noticed the dates on the first three and, and this one there on the left were really fast. And then a whole month went by. I, just, I was just getting sick of it. it was, I felt like I was kind of hitting some kind of a wall. And I left it for a month and went back to it and made just a few changes. And then at that point I began to just do small tweaks on the computer. So I don't really have a record of that. But I thought I'd read the finished poem, which you can read there, but uh, I don't need my book, do I? The hunter struggles his ATV to tear from the ruts and turn under dusk on, on, for the pewter trees, just December 30th, muzzle lotus season. Nothing of Vernon's riot, of autumn's apostrophe, winter, limbs of wind, ice clockworking in the brook, a gun papoosed with its stomach of black. We are desperate for pattern, desperate for the diamond wall. The track begins bluely to burn in the failure of sight, a threadbare flicker of edge, a candle here in the deep snow dim, a candle there, the day is ending, it is over, what we find now, we find permanently. Convulsions of spirit, the startle of startled winter, the granite heaps, the clutters, the comings apart, the nose knuckle, the shaved neck, the blazing eye, the hunter, alone in the labor of leaving the world. So I always had that final line in mind. I was just trying to get there and sort of convince myself of what I meant by it. And I, I chose this poem because I knew I had a lot of drafts of it that I could put my hand, hand on to, to uh, scan in for this. But I, I think it's interesting now, in the absence of a prompt or visual accompaniment like one of Laurie's illustrations, I can see that I've almost been thrown back on describing that sort of thing with those lines, we are desperate for pattern, desperate for the diamond wall, which for me, uh, what I'm trying to get at in those lines is the idea that we want everything to be coherent and to make sense, um, for everything to be a simplified version of the way things actually are, such that we can maybe wrap our heads around it. Um, I have been noticing in Laurie's work that you, you sort of a wallpapery effect would, would appear sometimes where everything would repeat um, in a very precise but sort of intricate and beautiful way. And so those lines about the diamond wall, I had those kind of, those kind of ideas in mind. And some of these things, it's pure, it's pure abstraction or fantasy, like a candle hair in the deep snow dim, a candle hair, there were no candles in the woods, but I'm sort of groping for, grasping for any kind of image that will convey the idea that everything is beginning to lift off and drift a little bit and things aren't quite what you'd expect. So what's next for me? Um, before we get on to that, um, because that was a, a complete turn. I don't have quite as many slides as Lori. <coughs> I didn't mean by anything, but yeah. <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, this, this I suppose is the classic kind of what I write about when I write about what I want to write about without any other filter or anything else sort of directing me because it's very much taken out of my own experience I try not to make stuff up. I mean, I have poems about meeting a coyote in the woods, or poems about you know moose and, and so on. I, I never make anything up. I never fabricate. I never, um, at least I try never to to falsify anything. So I hate the idea that I write nature poetry. People use this term. I don't know exactly what it means. I'm simply writing about stuff that I've experienced. And if I'm writing about about a cityscape or something like that, it feels like it's all the same ideas. It's the same person looking for a pattern, looking for something to grab onto. It's just my own experiences. A lot of it is full of walking around in the woods, so you write what you know, as they say. Um, and uh, well, yeah, let's go on to uh, let's go on. So the other side of what I another side of what I do with my creative time is I um, I um, I do a comic strip called called um, Buttercup Festival that I started way back when I was an undergrad at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I was working for the school newspaper doing something. Um, I was like writing film reviews and copy editing late, late at night. And we had a gap in the, uh, in the comic strip page. And everyone's a bit silly at 11.30 at night down in the student union just trying to get stuff done. I said, oh, I'll do a comic strip. And I did. 
And I kind of liked it. It was just fun to draw again, because I used to draw and I didn't anymore at the time. And it was fun to have an event for silliness. And then I just kept on going with it, and I kept on going with it after I graduated, as you know, this was as the internet was sort of taking off, um, as, a, as some, something that everyone would have access to. Um, and a lot of people like like us were creating websites. I created one for it and kind of got an audience for it. And it's I've only recently brought it to an end, a sort of a second break because I need to get the time back for other things. But it's just developed into um, this is a very silly one. Um, sometimes they're silly, sometimes they're not. It's uh, it's about a an unnamed character who kind of looks like the Grim Reaper, and he just sort of has zany adventures. Um, but the funny thing is, it's, it feels very much involved in the same sort of ideas that the poetry, the sort of the high-minded, serious poet, poetry, uh, is coming very much from the same place as this goofy stuff. It just sort of gives me another angle to kind of talk about it from, another angle to get at the ideas. and I, you know, I kind of like the fact that this guy makes a waffle out of, out of all this profound stuff and it has to sweeten it with syrup. Um, and originally, in the very, very early book, which are so ugly I, I wouldn't show you, um, the fact that he looked that this guy dressed like death was just a sort of a lame joke trying to make fun of, of some kind of a goth subculture. But I became more and more intrigued by the idea that he really was death and he was just sort of wandering around kind of like a tourist in the uh, in, the world very naively, kind of on a day off. And sometimes, recently, I've just taken to doing something that has no punchline. It's just me doodling. But I still try to have, I still try to touch on the same profound nonsense that the rest of it is about. This, so you have the, the main character there, the Grim Reaper looking character up in a tree, which he spends a lot of time doing. And, um, and he's looking down at, you can maybe just see a little positive space shadow, or negative space shadow of himself there in the white, who's looking up at him, and the, uh, the sort of, the opposite of him is sitting in a tree that's filled with stars. Now what I mean by that, I don't really know, but I just became, I become increasingly fascinated by these images of the cosmos appearing in little nooks and corners everywhere, and um, I think it's just, it's just another way to kind of scratch that creative itch, that, that sense of trying to, uh, trying to look for things in the world that you're pretty, there's something in you tells you are there, uh, but you have, to, you have to really try hard to see them. But as I say, I've recently brought this to an end after four or five years of doing a second series of them. Um, part of that is having a 14-month-old daughter who takes up a lot of time, and I just want to put the time back into other things. But um, I wanted to say something about the fact that I'd always in my head kept the poetry and the comic strip very much on opposite ends of something because um, the poetry is very serious, very high-minded, very like, oh, I write poetry and the, the comic is silly and its value to me is the fact that I don't take it seriously. It's just a goofy thing that I do. But um, that, that has value for me in the sense that I don't worry about what I do with it. I just have fun with it, but it becomes a bit of an honest, very honest sketch pad for my imagination. But there's a lot of crossover between the two actually has happened. Um, I, I had the opportunity to write the li, li, libretto, which is like the words for it, a, a, a mini opera um, with some composer who was a fan of the comic strip, but is an excellent composer, his name's uh, Joel Rust, and he asked me, he like approached me out of the internet blue to work with him on an opera, and I did, and it was a wonderful experience, and, um, and but he was, a, he was a fan of the comic strip, found me through, through the internet, that's how things work these days, and he's told the normal when I met him, so you know, the internet is, it's okay. And, uh, and also, um, this comic strip is now running in a journal called the, um, called the PN Review, which is one of the leading UK poet, poetry journals. Um, and I had actually, had, I had to submit my poems to them six or seven times before they would, they would accept a few poems to, to publish. This is how it goes in the poetry world. You need to keep on knocking at the door of these journals to, um, to uh, sort of get them to publish you. And you send them a batch of poems, and they turn them down. You send them another batch of poems, they turn them down. And I had to try this place six or seven times, and then they finally accepted four. But then about two, two months after that, the editor that came to me and said, oh, I saw you have a comic strip. Can you publish it? And I was, I was I've been afraid to even mention to these editors that I do a comic strip because I don't want to look silly. Um, and this guy 
wants to publish it, and he asked me, and I've had to beg him to publish my poem, so maybe I don't know what I'm doing with the poetry. But it just goes to show you that, you know, there's, there's a lot of crossover that, that you can accomplish with the internet and with getting to know people, and with sort of exploring your own ideas in different media. And last, I just thought I'd say a little word about uh, something that's just recently finishing up called The Renaming of the Bird, or Renaming of the Birds, which is a book that I have I wrote and illustrated, and um, I don't have any slides about it. I, this is the only one because I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's that new a thing, but I had written the storybook and illustrated it and tried for a few years to find a publisher that, that was really interested in publishing it. I couldn't find any. Got a few near hits, but eventually all the maybes turned into no's. So this being the, uh, the exciting internet age that it is, I am... Um, and knowing that I had an audience for it, I had a small but devoted audience of Buttercup Festival fans who would help, help me publish this, I, I created a, um, a Kickstarter campaign and I managed to raise uh, 6,700 pounds, I think, um, to fund the first printing of it. And, um, and I just got a few copies in here that literally arrived in the post on Tuesday, yes, yesterday, if anyone cares to have a look at the rest of the illustrations. Or, or you could buy a copy if you want, but I'm not here to sell you stuff. I kind of am. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, um, it was kind of an exciting experience because I got to lay out all the pages, or I, you could say I had to lay out all the pages on, on my own, so I saw the project through from, from beginning to end. And all of the headaches, I suppose, in a sense, that, the, that a proper publisher would have taken off my hands, I had to do. But at the same time, like arranging printing and dealing with, with, um, with proofs and quotes and, and paper specs and all this stuff. But at the same time, I got to do it and I had to wrap my head around it and learn, uh, learn about layout and learn lessons about how to do this and how not to do it and, and paint, uh, um, you know, printing talk and all that. And it was quite a good experience. And it felt in a way like I kind of got to cut the middleman out of it. Um, and I can go directly to the fans now. Um, with with this book, which is uh, which has been a very sort of exciting thing to to have accomplished, and it's also nice to have it in finished form. And now I'm having uh, having got this done and having ended Buttercup Festival, I feel like I can kind of draw a line and move on. But uh, it was a good lesson, and if you uh, if you can't get something to work one way, there's you know the internet and the crowdfunding uh, culture these days. There's a whole lot of different ways that you can go about things, and I think that's all I have to say. That's our last slide. So, I guess, do you have any questions for either of us? Anybody? Don't be shy. Second years? Go on, Lucy. Um, when you collaborate on the postcards, was there any time when you actually received each of us you know, work and thought, ooh, that's not so far away from what I was thinking or I think we each other to be quite yeah. free, but there I can't say um, some poems I said maybe instantly I think of something. I guess the same with a, a brief if I'm working on I'll get an idea straight away and then other ones it takes a bit more work, maybe because they are talking about something that I can't relate to as much. So I wouldn't say that I have to think like, oh god, like Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think the collaborations would be quite boring, both for us and for, for the audience, um, if, they, if, if we were too accurate and too, too literal. The, the sort of the fun part of it is that we create a kind of a prompt in the space for the other person, but then that person is free to you know, do what they want. So it has, a, it has a, a largeness of ideas and a looseness that would be boring if, if Lori were merely illustrating my poem or I were really just describing Lori's print. I think we do have, because we haven't shown all of them, There's not, that's not the reason we left them out, but there are some that I have, I like more than others, for that, I think for that reason as well. So that's more of my own, I like my own illustrations more or less, just because I think they either, the collaboration either works better or, or maybe not as well. As yeah, there are a few where I, I think they hit, like their, their daughter, I, I always think is of one that really hits the mark well with the two of us, and the, uh, the concert one as well, even though we are writing about different, or sort of coming at it from different things and different ideas, I think that they work very well together. There are other ones where maybe there's a bit more dissonance, you know? Yeah. 
But that's part of the fun of it, really. Um, aside from like collaborating with somebody, you know, how's like the best way to go around like promoting yourself as an illustrator? Um, sort of like the the print work or the or the more the commission, like to get commissions. Um, pretty much to get commissions. So. To get commissions. Um, there's lots of things you can do. Um, but I suppose what I started out doing was, um, I people advised me to do a, a mail out. So um, you can get kind of books from the Association of Illustrators, a like, really amazing um, organisation who can give you those of information. But, um, and then you can buy lists of, of art directors off them. So I started out by writing kind of a personal note um, with a post postcard of my work and sent them off to each of them. And then you've got to phone them up um, and say, did you get my postcard? And then they will say, no, I didn't. And then you say, can I send you a link? And they send them a link. So it's like really, sometimes they'll get it and they'll call you. But a lot of times, you, if it's someone you really want to work for, you have to kind of chase it up. Yeah. Um, and then obviously having a really good website. You can also do it by just emailing art directors and just saying, would you like to have a look at my work? And I think it's a good thing of not kind of asking for work, sort of like, oh, please commission me kind of thing. But if you say, are you available to meet up and I can show you my portfolio, then you're kind of, they get to meet you, they know that you're, you know, normal and that you'll do the job and, you know, so I think that's the best way to get out there. And really important to have, like, website and um, just really kind of clean and um, sort of easy for them to, I suppose that's quite a commercial thing, if, you, if they, they have, they don't have a lot of time, so that you, if they're going to click a link, they need to be able to see who you are and what you're about. Thank you. Could you just mention about the other coin about the agent? Well. Uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't have an agent until earlier this year, um, and um, she approached me, but I then approached some other ones as well. Um, and the agent, she, I think she has been doing lots of background work in terms of she'll go and meet people, but I haven't actually seen as much work through her. Um, she'll obviously take a cut. So you can go the route of getting an agent, and they'll do a lot of that background work for you. But I think you're more attractive to get a better agent if you've done a little bit of it yourself and got some experience and shown that you're really serious about illustration and, and getting commissioned. So you can get a couple of commissions under your belt first, um, and that's quite good. I mean, when I first graduated, like I say, in the call centre, after that, I, I worked do, um, doing graphics a few days a week for a while. And um, the, the, con the first kind of um, work I did was unpaid, um, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but sometimes when you're first starting out, it's just to get something published. And it was a book I, I did through um, through Dave. Um, oh, yeah, two yeah. It wasn't actually your work, it's another poet's work. Um, and that was unpublished, and then I had some published work to say, look, I've, I've been published, and you know that kind of gave me the jump up to then people take you a bit more seriously when they've got something in print. And, Anyone would like to stay behind and just have a quick chat with um, David and Laurie in terms yeah. of the illustration of poetry? Do you, you know, yeah. otherwise you can, you can do it. Or you've got some tension stuff if you want to look up poetry or anything. Thank you. <laugh